the burden of ending, ending up in um in prison for a, for a portion of my life or our lives because of this prohibition. So I do hope that everyone that is that is on this call does realize that you know the importance of of what this industry brings and the history that this this industry brings and the many lives that it, it has impacted and again in a negative way in which now we're hoping to make this a positive experience for many people of, of our community and people of color, just like us. Um, so to speak about criminalization, we wanna talk a little bit about the history. We're not gonna dive too deep into it, but when speaking about the history of criminalization, three acts must always be mentioned. The Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, the Boggs Act of 1951, and the Controlled Substance Act of 1970. The purpose of the Marijuana Tax Act and the Boggs Act was to, put pressure on medical, industrial, and recreational hemp production in the United States through taxation and minimal jail sentences. Sorry, from there, we have pretty much the, the, the act that delivered the final blow to the criminalization of cannabis was the Controlled Substance Act, created by Nixon, the Nixon administration that stated marijuana was determined to be a Schedule One drug, labeling it as addictive, addictive and harmful as heroin and banned from almost all use. Shortly after the act's passing, Richard Nixon initiated the war on drugs. The war on drugs resulted in mass incarceration, over-policing, and especially over-policing in minority communities. I mean, I think for some, for many of us that come from that background and come from that world, we all we all know how how much how much marijuana arrests there have been, how many people have been harassed on the street or even in their own homes when they're partaking, and um, and all of this really derived from these acts and these limitations that were put forward on our on our people, right? And unfortunately for these acts, um, they, they weren't necessarily made to really help people, right? The, the, the truth of the matter is, is that these acts, and as you can see here, sorry, I'm just trying to, there's things, things coming up on my screen. Um, because of the war on drugs, many lives were negative to, negatively impacted. Many even impacted over multiple generations that has led to a major focus in social equity now, nowadays to correct this wrong, as Dwayne had mentioned previously. I would like to read this quote because it depicts the true injustice the war on communities was really about. So John from the, the presidential, the, um, from the, this the assistant to the president for domestic affairs under President Richard Nixon stated, you want to know what this war on drugs was really all about? The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt these communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know what we were we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So team and, and everyone on this call, this is the true reason why we're here presenting this information, right? This, this situation that we are in right now wasn't by accident. It was done on purpose, right? And, and as this legalization comes through the pipelines, not, a, not helping and helping our disenfranchised communities to benefit from it, that's the true, that's the true crime now. Right. And again, and we keep reemphasizing the importance of why we're presenting this to, to you today, because we really want you to take advantage of this. This opportunity is for you. Right. And I know if, if we go into communication, I mean, into conversation, many of us neither know someone or we're that someone that ended up being being part of the justice system. Right. Because of because of cannabis. All right. Now for some good news. All right. And begin to talk about. Uh, about where we are here on this call and why we are here on this call today, which is the legalization of cannabis. So let's begin by giving a round of applause to New Mexico for doing it right, be the first state to enact legislation and recognize the medical uses of, of cannabis in 1978. But the true turning point and the true hero of the story is California. Okay, in 1996, when California legalized cannabis for medical purpose, it was the start of a trend for legalization in the United States, okay? One of the things of my background in this was the fact that the, re, the my experience in growing and being in the cannabis space, just like David, we had to leave New York State to be able to do this. My experience came through the legalization of California, right? Which again, gives us a little bit of a, a leg up in essence, knowing what been some of the shortcomings these states have faced 
as they roll this out. And as to why, and again, repeating over and over while we're here, one of the things that seem to be a big gap in these other states is community outreach and that community engagement and really helping people understand how to participate in this, in this space, okay? So which brings us now to my favorite part of this presentation, speaking about our own hood, New York State. In 2014, the, the governor, Andrew Cuomo, signed legislation that allowed the medical marijuana in New York State, but because of COVID-19, it delayed legislation of marijuana for recreational use, but it finally came into fruition on March 31st, 2021, when the Marijuana Regulation Taxation Act, also known as MRTA team, this is a good one to know, all right, one of the things that as we're out here teaching and educating our community, like every other profession or every other industry, every industry has, in, has their own professional language, right? So as you're going to these workshops, getting further educated, going to some of these networking events, these are, these are gonna be some of the terms um, and concepts that they're gonna be dropping. And it's good for everyone to, to, again, have an understanding of what they're referring to. So the MRTA was signed into law and making us at New York, the 18th, excuse me, the 18th state to legalize cannabis for recreational use. Round of applause, I love it. Okay, now let's talk about legal cannabis in New York and how new laws in cannabis production both protect and provide opportunities to our local communities. All right, for now, looking at our cannabis timeline, this is a good way for, for us to get a, a perception of, of what this road has been here in New York State, okay? We've been at it since 2014 with the Medical Use Cannabis Compassionate Care Act being released. Then in December 20th, 2018, the Hemp License Farm Bill was enacted. That led now to the March 31st, 2021 Marijuana Reg and Tax Act, MRTA, that we just spoken about. And then now the Cannabinoid Hemp Program. Now we're, now we're in this, pretty much where we are now is dealing with the Conditional Processing License and the conditional cultivator license that were just recently released and they're in the process of uh, accepting your first, um, um, I'm sorry, these were already released, um, which they have about, correct me, around 261. 261 cultivators. And the one that was just recently released, and again, excuse me for that mistake there, um, was the conditional dispensary, Cura. That, that was um, just released for us to be able to apply and, um, and we're, wait, we're actually waiting to see if we all here at the New Growth Center got, were able gonna be able to participate in this. But this is, has been those first initial steps in order to, to, to provide that social equity to the community, right? The conditional processing license and the conditional pro cultivator license were only released to distressed farmers, right? On the conditional dispensary side, you, did need to, you needed to meet a, a certain um, criteria. criteria. Thank you, David as far as what, what allowed you to, to apply and usually meant that you had to have some level of, um, of, of issues with the law. You had to have been impacted by cannabis in order just to, to apply. If you had not been impacted negatively through, through cannabis through the justice system, you were not allowed to apply, but the time is, the time is coming and David's gonna talk to you about those licenses that will be coming down the pipeline. All right. Not, not only is the MRTA responsible for legalizing recreational use, but it's also created new Office of Cannabis Management, also known as the OCM. Team, another great uh, term or agency to know about. Um, the Office of Cannabis Management is pretty much the office. It's the agency that is managing everything cannabis in New York State, okay, which is governed by a cannabis control board to comprehensively regulate adult use, medical, and hemp cannabis. The OCM is responsible for issuing licenses and developing regulation, outlining how and when business can participate in the new industry. Besides the OCM being responsible for the development and implementation of regulation and of the cannabis industry here in New York State, but they're also very importantly responsible for ensuring social justice, public, public health and safety, and economic development through comprehensive regulatory framework that centralized licensing, enforce, enforcement, and economic development functions. And team, over and over, you keep hearing these, these, these same, same terms or these, these same goals, right? That again, it keeps coming down to this economic development through uh, social equity and really focusing on, on, on helping the community at large be successful in this space as this industry rolls out. Um, this, comes, this quote comes directly from the OCM. We wanted to share this with you because it really encompasses what the OCM is all about. The positive effects of a regulated marijuana market 
in New York State outweigh the potential negative impacts. Areas that may be cause for concern can be mitigated with regu regulation and proper use of public education that is tailored to address key populations. Incorporating proper metrics and indicators will ensure rigorous and ongoing evaluation. This is very important as we travel into unknowns in the rollout of this industry here in, in our state. There, there, has been, there has to be constant rigorous evaluation, community communication, and execution. And this is why, again, having this, this conversation with you all is so important to us because we see as this being a pillar to what the OCM is also trying to accomplish in providing that community outreach and constantly receiving the feedback from the community to create those regulations and standards that really fit the need and the, and the, um, and the wants of those that they're looking to serve. Um, so here's the OCM's governing board members. We have the executive director, Chris Alexander. We have Chairwoman Trumaine Wright, and we have the new Chief, Chief Equity Officer, Damon Fagon, all right? All of which play extremely important roles. Um, for the most part, you will be seeing Trumaine Wright doing a lot of the, the tours in New York State, doing a lot of the community outreach, speaking to the community, educating the community. Um, so definitely, as those of you that get more and more involved in the space, I'm pretty sure you're gonna come across her. Um, and now also working with Damon's new position, He's so focused on really bringing social equity to, the, to this industry and really figuring out ways and how he could positively impact the, the space. Okay, here we have the OCM's website where you can go to at www.cannabis.ny.gov. Here you can find up-to-date, relevant, and pertinent information about the cannabis industry here in New York State. Um, it's very easy to use. We, that we highly recommend for you all to visit and become familiar with it. But at the very least, please sign up for their newsletter to stay up to date with what's happening. They have um, every every uh, board meeting that they have, they make it public. They send you the, they'll send you in their newsletters or in their emails updates um, of when these these meetings are happening. So you have real time education and not not necessarily getting into this information from the mouth of someone else. Um, and also just how there's a lot of resources there. Right. Many of you that are interested in getting, getting a license, you may want to, to do some research on here, find out what the requirements are of the licenses. If you fall, and we're gonna discuss about this, but if you fall under some of the, um, the disadvantaged community individuals that they, the OCM really wants to help and what are the criteria is there. So again, it's, it, they've done a very, very good job in creating a holistic, a holistic uh, website with all the, all the per pertinent information that you need and they keep it fairly up to date. I, I have to say that it's, again, as at the moment that I receive an email, whatever new information is coming out or even whatever information I, I could find out through a newspaper of sorts, of sorts or a news outlet, for the most part, the OCM already has the information up there and probably explains it better than most news outlets that we've come across. So again, we recommend, please become familiar with the website and at the very least sign up for their newsletter and their, and their uh, the outreach efforts. All right, as previously mentioned, the OCM will provide a comprehensive regulatory framework, also known as CRF. The OCM will have a hyper-focus on social justice, public health, and economic development. I would like to go through the definition of what you all, uh, what you all to, to, for, with, with all of you to better comprehend the important purpose that the CF, CRF uh, serves. Social justice establishes a robust social and economic equity program to actively encourage members from communities disappropriately impacted by policies of prohibition to participate in the new industry. Public safety. Please mute your phone because you're yeah, interrupting. Yeah, please. Can somebody mute their phone? Thank you. Public, public health safety administers a sophisticated quality assurance regulatory structure, including standards for production and manufacturing strict product testing labeling, packaging, and advertising to ensure products are safe for consumers and not targeted to youth. And team, this is extremely important, right? I, outside, of, outside of the social equity and, and being able to create business and the commerce and all the economic development that comes through this, one caveat that, that's constantly missed, right? Or not perceived as very important is this public safety component, right? You, you, I don't know if you remember, but when right before COVID happened that summer, there was a there was a, a whole bunch of people that were got that got sick because in New York in New York State in New York City 
because they were buying um, uh, oils from, um, you know, their local bodegas, right? So they were buying these oils and they ended up collapsing their lungs because they had done an improper extraction uh, uh, strategy that was probably the cheapest. And because of that, people were getting hurt and were getting sick, right? Now, with this new these new standards being implemented, you know exactly what you're putting in your body. And on top of that, the, the standards and regulations that they're going to put forward to 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 to, to make sure that that does happen is going to put us in a better and much better place. And lastly, on that point, especially when we look at, at, at cannabis under the scope of medical and in medical benefits, it makes no sense not to give not to give this that level of importance and value that we are we are giving it. So so again, that public health and safety team is extremely important. And and it's something again, that's really why this we we that have been part of the legacy market wanted this taxation act the MRTA to come into play because we want to be able to communicate about the health and the, the how organic our products are and so forth and create um, uh, product differentiation and, and allow us to grow based on quality, right? Um, as far as economic development, they're going to be encouraging small businesses and farmers to participate in the cannabis industry with the creation of micro business, cooperatives, and delivery license types. Awesome. Social and econ uh, economic equity is the cornerstone in developing a thriving, inclusive cannabis industry here in New York. To do so, New York will be incentivizing participation from underrepresented communities that historically have been disproportionately punished by the war on drugs and disenfranchisement that we see here today. Okay, again, you see, and you see that these, this language is very repetitive, team. I don't, there's not really much mystery to the, the problem that was created on the war on drugs. Now, the, the constant solution is us doing right and giving back to, to our communities that were most impacted by this war on drugs. Other communities that have been disproportionately impacted will also will also be, be supported by the OCM. So we're talking about anyone that, that is a minority or, or woman-owned business, distressed farmers, and service-disabled veteran, veterans. If anyone of, on, on this call right now fall under any of these groups, know that there's going to be much opportunity to take advantage of. OK, and again, all this information can be found on the OCM website. They provide and give you the information on each of these topics. What are the requirements to fall under one of these one of these um, uh, impacted communities and how you're going to be able to take advantage of the licensing that are coming down the pipeline by by you being a part of one of these um, these groups. OK. Now. At this point of the presentation, again, is where I get super excited. I'm going to take a little break, too, because I'm going to be able to do the handoff to my man, David. Uh, it's been a long time coming, especially for those that have been have been in the legacy market. Matter of fact, uh, David and I were talking about, you know, how 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 long it's been. You know, when I when when I was introduced to cannabis, it was about I'm 38 now. So I'm going to give you my age, about 20, 22 years old because it was a necessity. I got into cannabis because it was a way out to put food on my table growing up with a single mother, right? And it was a, it was a way to, to, to manage the shortcomings financially that brought so much stress to my life, especially when I had a single mother raising my, my younger brother and myself and trying to give us a good life, right? And, and from there, David and I both realized like, man, we've been in this space for such a long time. So many risks we're taking as well when when we did take them uh, here in New York, and then all the hard work that has been has been put forth from you know people in jail, people politicians, and then the people that work this space, right? It's not easy to cultivate. It's not easy to do the work that 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 cannabis requires for you to do to be successful. But it's it's an honor and a pleasure to to be able to speak about this here right now. Okay, so the Office of Cannabis Management, uh, the OCM, is charged with issuing licenses. Okay, for businesses to participate in adult use medical and cannabinoid hemp industries, to begin accepting applications for the adult use program, the OCM needs to issue and implement regulation establishing the application process for different license types. Then the OCM will actively promote social and economic equity applicants who have been harmed by the prohibition of cannabis for adult use licenses, establishing a goal of awarding 50% of licenses to social and economic equity applicants woo, woo, team it's 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 and let's and we're hoping and we want to be a part of this goal our goal here at, at the new growth center is to propel this 50 percent of social equity applicants to be successful 
okay? And the last point is music to my ears. I now have the privilege to hand over the presentation to our cannabis subject matter expert, David Elliott. For David and I, again, this is a real moment. We never thought that this day would come that we would be speaking about the legalization of cannabis. Data are not our only business partners, but longtime friends for over 20 years. He had to endure a lot of injustice having to participate in the legacy market. But without further ado, mi gente, our boy David, David Elliott. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Alex. Um, well, welcome everybody. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is David Elliott. Uh, New York, I'd like to tell you, he's jipping you. He has notes on the computer. <laughs> hey, I got a notebook. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to keep up here. So a little bit of my background. When it comes down to hemp, um, I own several companies. Uh, one of them, Uruguay Hemp Exchange, which is a hemp production company based out of Uruguay. Uh, 2021, we produced over 20,000 pounds. Uh, last year, we scaled down to 6,000 pounds of production just to match market size and then the national level, which is, is what we had to do. And if you've been in the market, even in the United States, uh, everything is going crazy. The West is is low, the East is coming up. So it, it's a it's a battle to to be able to, to navigate those waters. Um, aside from that, I own a company called Matter CBD. Uh, that's a research and development company for cannabis products, uh, which one of my partners, uh, Daniel Carvalho is here on the call too. Um, we are able to produce, research, and develop products, import and export products into Brazil and Mexico now. Uh, I think we are one of the first companies to ever do that. Um, as far as medical licensing, um, my background with that, well, that's when I really started doing heavy cultivation. And that's when I, I moved to Oregon. I joined the medical program, which is the medical program that the OCM just put out. Uh, I think it was October 5th, if I'm not wrong, 2022. Um, majority of my experience came from a market in which I was able to grow THC rich flower um, as a caregiver and I had patients, et cetera, et cetera. We'll get into that program later. And as far as uh, adult use, well, like my good friend Dwayne says all the time, legacy, 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 legacy. Uh, we've been around for a long time and now we have the opportunity to apply for these licenses, you know, pay taxes, have uh, all the comprehensive uh, networks and um, procedures, right? SOPs to be able to bring the best product to the table or to your home or wherever it is that you're going to pick up your, your product from. Next. This is uh, the hemp license farm bill. All right. So in 2018, uh, the United States federal government passed uh, the farm uh, the farm bill. With, uh, what this led to was all the states in the United States with their own self-governing, if they wanted to, they could pass law to uh, or allowed or put a governing body to be able to uh, grow hemp. Now, I want to get into what is the definition of hemp because there's a huge, huge, huge confusion about what is hemp and what is cannabis. In 2018, the Farm Bill allowed you to grow a cannabis flower that was less than 0.3% THC. Now, this is a cannabis flower. It is not hemp. Hemp is grown for fiber and seeds. But because the government wants to control the THC consumption and sales of it, they decided that 0.3% THC uh, was the threshold to be able to call it a hemp plant. So anything under 0.3% in the United States, riddle me that, in Brazil is 0.2, in Mexico is 0.1. So how can it be the same plant called hemp when the cannabinoid levels are the ones that dictate that? Another thing I wanted to touch on on the hemp was, um, well, we can get into that on the next, on the other slides, which is, uh, this is the cannab cannabinoid hemp program. All right, this program uh, is one of the greatest things that the OCM did. Because now all the products, hemp-based CBD products, need to be produced in New York, meaning the money stays in New York. There's no outside states bringing products into the state in order to, you know, and then they get to reap the benefits from that. Even if they don't have income tax or whatever way their state is set up, if you're going to sell CBD products, they need to be produced in New York. Now, in order to sell those products, the CBD company needs to pay a $600 license in order to sell those products in retail, and the retail company needs to be needs to pay a three hundred dollar license to be able to sell those products. Now, the definition is not there yet to know is is it three hundred dollars per uh, uh, brand or how is it going to work? I'm pretty sure it's going to be just uh, one three hundred dollar fine or fee, 
yearly, so you'll be able to sell the CBD products. But you need to get those licenses in order to sell CBD products. I don't know if you guys have seen um, uh, hemp products or CBD products all over the city. That's going to change a little bit because now you're going to have to pay in order to be able to sell it. Um, what else I had? I had something else from the uh, cannabinoid, uh, cannabinoid or hemp program. Uh, boy, we go back. Um, medical cannabis program. All right, three key players. We have the patient, the, the person that's going to prescribe, right? The doctor or practitioner. And then we have the caregiver. This is the same program that I joined in Oregon. So if you have a debilitating condition or a life-threatening condition, then you are allowed to purchase medical cannabis. If you have a debilitating condition, then you most likely may be not able to go purchase or grow your own cannabis. So through the medical program, you, these patients are allowed to have up to two caregivers that can grow, pass, uh, possess, deliver, and sell, basically, uh, to their patients. Uh, the designated caregiver can have up to four patients. Um, now, the practitioner, which is the person that prescribes or gets you certified or registered, needs to do a uh, needs to be start uh, need to be certified registered in New York to be able to prescribe human consumption. Uh, how do you call it? Substance control or human consumption? I'm going over the head over here, guys. All right, bear with me. Um, if you do, if you do want to get registered, if you do want to get your medical license, you should get in touch with us. Uh, we will have a, um, a click link on the presentation that you can get the presentation uh, after we're done. You'll be able to click there. It was going to take you to our resources. You'll be able to uh, hopefully connect with one of our uh, practitioners that will get you uh, registered and, and so on, and we can move on. Next. Types of adult use licenses. So. These are the licenses for cultivation, uh, processing, distribution, delivery, retail, okay? Um, these are the licenses that we've been waiting for uh, to come out. Now, there are a few licenses that have come out when it comes down to cultivation and then retail. We'll talk about it right now on the next slide. So this is the adult use uh, license matrix. This is how you see uh, the layout on the OCM. If you see at the bottom, it says click here, the link. Also, uh, if you request or go to the website for the presentation and download it, you'll be able to click there and it'll take you to the uh, OCM website where you'll be able to see exactly what we provided here, which is the adult use cultivation, um, uh, cultivation, the conditional cultivation. Uh, we have the nursery, uh, processor, um, and dis uh, distributor. It's hard to see from here, bro. Next, yeah, yeah, go to the next. All right, so this, this is the cultivator license. This is this is what I like to say. This is the probably the riskiest license out of all the licenses. If you've been in the industry, you know that growing cannabis is risky. And if you want to know more about those risks, then you should join our cannabispreneur uh, class that we're going to be putting out. Where we can assess risk, we can sort of guide you on, on you know what you need to do for this, what what you know what's coming if you apply for this license, etc. Now that dual use cultivation license allows you to clone, harvest, dry, curing. Uh, grading and trimming of the cannabis plant, but it can only sell to a distributor or a processor. An adult cultivator license cannot sell directly to a retail. It can only sell to a processor or a distributor. Now, adult use cultivators can have a processing license and a distribution license only for their products. So here's where it gets tricky because this program that the OCM put together they're not allowing vertically integrated businesses. They're not allowing you to vertically integrate your businesses, right? But there are exceptions. If you cultivate your own product, you are able to process it and deliver it to the retail spaces. But you cannot, you cannot sell to a retail. Um, you cannot sell uh, other people's products uh, to, uh, to retail. Um, next. Oh, well, hold on. As far as cultivation. There is no, here's where I expect to see the highest, uh, the biggest numbers of square footage for growing. This adult uh, cultivation license, here's where we're gonna see 100,000 square foot or, or a million square foot of, of cultivation space. In addition, there's a conditional cultivation license. That has already come out. There's 261 licenses that were awarded. Key fact, only half of them are producing. 
So where is the cannabis flower going to come from for the retailers? Where are we getting the, our cannabis flowers? So There's something that OCM needs to work out. I've heard some things in the in the grapevines that they might they might look for a way to uh, get product from other states in. I'm not sure that that's even possible, uh, but I can guarantee you there will be a shortage of cannabis flowers, especially for these 150 conditional dispensary licenses that are being awarded. Not only that, those 261 licenses that were awarded are forced to grow, whether outdoor or combination greenhouse for the next two years. So that's another thing that uh, brings issues to the first flowers, well, not issues, not to, maybe not to you, but uh, the legal market compared to the legacy market is not gonna be able, be able to keep up with the quality because the legacy market has high quality indoor flower. And now we are putting out greenhouse or outdoor flower. Now I personally light assisted or light deprivation flower. I love it. I think it's just the same as indoor, but you know, you have your picky people out there. So I wonder how that's going to turn out. And um, yeah, let's go next. Nursery. Nursery is where you can clone, you can sell seeds, you can propagate, but that's all you can do with immature plants. You cannot go into a flower state or bloom state. All right. Uh, they are able to sell um, to uh, micro businesses. They are able to sell to cooperatives uh, and cultivators. Uh, so they, they're able to get, uh, grow uh, grow their plants. They're also allowed to sell all their agricultural agricultural products. There's a list of it. I'm not going to go through all of it. Processor. Here's where we extract cannabinoids. This is one of my favorite licenses. If I had the money, I would do it, but I don't have it. So I'm just going to let the other guys do it. Here's where we can extract and create products. Here's uh, something that Dan and I do through Meta CBD. Uh, with extractions, we're able to create, whether we do gummies, tinctures, um, topical creams for pain or moisturizers. This is your processing license. Now, the processor can have a distribution license also, but it can only distribute its product. The processor can also intake product from an adult cultivator, process it, and give it back to, uh, uh, well, sell it to the, to the cultivator's distributor. It cannot sell other people's products. Distributor, this, again, I think that this license was put in here. I call this the middleman. I think this license was put here literally to monitor the cannabis and, and to have it properly stored, but it does put a tax basically in between the cultivator and the retail space because now the cultivator needs to sell to the distributor and then the distributor needs to sell to the retail. So the distributor can buy from all cultivators and it can sell to all retails. All right, you got that clear? Good. Cooperative, another one. I like this, but it's hard to understand on everybody because I, I, I do the reference of a, a cooperative compared to a business, right? So if you have, the, the good thing about cooperative is it's supposed to operate in a democratic fashion, right? Member owned, member managed. They should be able to um, grow, uh, process, but they're not able to sell to retail. They can only sell to a distributor or amongst themselves. Um, there is no square footage uh, instruction. We don't know how big the cultivations are gonna be. Is there, a, I, we know that if you read the, the, the presentation, we know that there will be limitations on how much you can produce and process and et cetera. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be one physical space where multiple growers can come and do their thing or multiple licenses or, or, or processes, right? They can vertically integrate through different people. I'm not sure the OCM has to give uh, a little bit more of a definition and uh, clarity on this. Next. Micro business, my favorite. I love this. Micro business, you are able to vertically integrate. You are able to, uh, you can have your nursery, your cultivation, you can uh, process, you can distribute and retail, but only your product, okay? And you have a cap. You have a cap. They haven't decided what the cap is, but through the grapevines, I've heard it might be between 7,000 square feet to 10,000 square feet. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty, I'm, I kind of kind of think that that's what's going to happen here. Um, you are able, well, I already explained what you are able to do. Um, and yes, I, I'm a micro business, well, in all of these licenses, you are not allowed to have um, interest on other licenses unless it's how I explained to you, right? So the, the micro business, you're able to have all of them. If you're a processor, you're able only to distribute your own stuff. 
you can have that type of uh, vertical integration, but you cannot have, I can be a processor and a cultivator and process other people's products as well. That is not happening, which is great because it allows, it allows everybody to be able to compete and have a market share. Um, I don't know if you guys understand that uh, in the part, how, how that works in the business part of it. You know what I mean? If they, if they cap you on, your, on, on what you can do, then you allow people to come in and have different parts of the businesses. I think it's great. All right. I'm done. <laughs> no, you're not. We're, trying, like, we're doing the switcheroo here. Um, thank you, David, once again, my Thanks, friend. Um, sure. did great. Um, I would say a round of applause to, for, for here because we know we we big up our team all the time. And you, uh, my boy, my boy David, I like I told you, you know, we were a little nervous coming up here, but we were all picking each other up, letting each other know that you know we've been doing this for a long time. We know this stuff, and now we get the the privilege and the opportunity to speak to Jan, teach you all about about what we know. Right. Um, with that said, I know that, you know, for David, he has a, a huge passion for this business. Right. As you can hear, you could hear it in his voice. Right. And one of the things I did want to ask, because we, you know, we're coming here kind of towards the end, but I do want to get a little bit more information. But as far as, let's say, on the cultivating side, you know, what, what has been some of the biggest hardships you felt even out there, like limitations, whether because of lack of communication from the government or maybe overstepping from the government? or just the community itself not being receptive, but what has been something well, that you've, you've seen out West that has been really, really tough to deal with on the cultivation side? Well, everything. I mean, to uh, every time you're gonna cultivate or you're gonna join this business, you have to do a market research of where you're gonna be. You're subjected to your state. You can, it's not federally legal. So you're subjected, for example, I was living in Oregon and cultivating in Oregon. There's 3 million people, 4 million people in Oregon. Only about 250,000 to 300,000 people consume can cannabis. So your market's small. When um, when I left uh, New York to Oregon, I knew when New York became legal, it was going to be the biggest market. It's the, heavy, it's the heaviest uh, dense population in all the United States. Um, so I think that uh, my biggest issue in Oregon was population, right, for market size. Um, the, uh, the government not knowing how to move forward. And now, now again, this is, uh, this is Oregon, which was one of the pioneers, which I expect New York to move differently. New York has the experience from, from all of the other states and it has professionals like us that know what we're doing and we're here now. So um, yeah, that's, that's a little, bit, a, little, a little bit of that. Depends on where you go to. If you go to Europe, where, for example, the biggest issues I had were ants. So <laughs> we, 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 we get into, Fair enough. We no, and, I'm, and I'm sure we talk about cultivation. We got to deal with mites. You're dealing with mold. And that's something here in New York State that, matter of fact, we just got news of that, right? About about how how they've been testing pretty much all the, the, the plants. So I've, I've heard that they've tested a lot of the products that have come out of the New York outdoor mm -hmm. conditional licenses that were awarded to cultivators. And they tested high for microbials. So mold and, and mildew. Uh, and that's something, I mean, come on, New York. Uh, it's so humid here. How do you not expect to have mold and mildew in your plants? And then you only, you expect these farmers in the first two years of cultivation uh, to grow outdoors in, in the greenhouse. Greenhouse, I think, is the only way to go here in New York. I think outdoor, if you're going to grow, grow at home, grow an early finisher. So you're, you're done early before the humidity hits the state. And that's a uh, no, excellent point. Thank you, man. And I'm glad you shared that because, um, you know, one of my one of my biggest, I guess, the hardest thing that I had to deal with that West was was mold. Right. We had in California, I was growing up in uh, Lake County. We had a lot of uh, it was like living on the desert, man, probably the hottest I've ever experienced the earth, man. But um, when the, the fall time came around, it, we were getting closer to harvest season and we got early rain that we weren't expecting. And because of that, we didn't have enough time to 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 harvest quickly enough to try to alleviate it. And, and we did end up losing like 20, 30 percent of the crop just to mold. Well, it's something that we, we, we've adapted a, a, as cultivators is we, we, we try to use early finishes. But just exactly. like everything, an early finisher gives you a less, uh, not always, but most likely will give you less cannabinoid content than a, a late finisher. So uh, you have to outweigh your risk, right? Whether I'm going to finish early with a less less cannabinoid content or I'm going to finish late with more cannabinoid content. You got to weigh that out. No, excellent. And, and, to you. and Tim, look, one of the things you're, you're able to do with us is um, uh, set up a 15 minute consultation with us where we could have a quick conversation with you about your cultivation needs. We did look at the polls and it seems that the majority of people on this, on this call come from that type of background. 
So we are we do extend our expertise to you all, and and if you if you want to to come in and and um and learn a little bit more about what we just spoke about, um please feel free to 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 sign up and set up a um a meeting with us. Okay. So now to to close down the the licensings that we have available. Okay. So we have our adult use uh, retail license uh, license. This this is defined as means by any person who sells at retail any cannabis products to cannabis consumers. Uh, retail dispensary and license authorize the acquisition, possession, sale, and delivery of cannabis from the licensed premises of the retail dispensary by such licensee to cannabis consumers. Team, look, to the same point here, to, to what David kept emphasizing, um, this is where now you have where the outlet is, right? Cultivators cannot sell to the, to the, to the, to the end user, okay? The, the, the cultivator can either all, only pass it on to a processor that has a license or them themselves process their own cannabis pass it on to a distributor, or if they want, just to send the flower, whatever, straight to the dispensary, potentially could do that, but they cannot sell to directly to the end user. This is where the dispensary and the, the retail license come into play. Another caveat here is that no person may own more than three retail dispensary licenses. Retail licensees may not own or have any other interest in licensee in the cultivation, processing, or distribution tier. And team, again, this is very important on the social equity side and economic development, right? If you have, if you have these, these huge corporations taking over New York State, and to David's point on what he just mentioned, New York State is probably the biggest consuming state, if not just the United States, probably in the world. I've, I've, we've done research and the stuff that we've learned, California is probably one of the highest producing cannabis state or geographic location in the world that produces the most cannabis. New York State is a place that consumes the most cannabis, okay? There's more pounds that come into New York State than anywhere anywhere in the world, okay? So, so with that said, team, they're really looking to maintain that social equity component and, and really limit how to, to, to limit any opportunities or potentialities of, of monopolies being created. We also have on-site consumption. Very simple. This is like, oh, it's gonna, it's a cannabis bar, team. It's like cannabis bar, cannabis restaurant. That's a on-site consumption. Because the consumption of cannabis is in an area licensed by the cannabis control board. All right. On and this side is again, you're purchasing, you're purchasing your products from a cultivator, you're purchasing it from a processor and or a distributor, and creating an ambiance or an experience for your for your customers and allows your customers to consume the, the product on site without having any problems. So I'm sorry to cut you off, but on on retail, the conditional license, if you want to touch. Oh, on that. thank you for that. Yes, yes, David. So that's why you saved me, my brother. Sorry. Thank you for that, David. No uh, team. So we also had the conditional retail dispensary license that was just recently uh, released, known as Cur Curad. Curad. Sorry. Hard. Hard. Cards. Thank you, team. <laughs> As you can see, we're a team here all day. Um, which was just recently released that allowed um, for New York State residents to apply for a license that was made available to those that were impacted by the war on drugs. So you you to have you in order for you to qualify to, to apply for this license, you needed to have had a, a record of being arrested for cannabis. OK, you also needed to show show that you are were a competent business owner. So you also needed to show that either you or a business partner that was on your team had a minimum of two years of positive of, of profits in their business and combine those having those two things combined pretty much allowed you to apply for that that um, conditional retail license. One one last one last point to that as well is the fact that by applying for this and if and when we get awarded or any of us get awarded for this dispensary license, um, it's a turnkey opportunity where through DASNY, they're gonna be able to provide us a full of a dispensary already ready to go. Um, they'll provide us the site, the equipment and, the, and, and what's needed in order for us to, to actually run our business. Um, obviously it's not gonna be for free. It's gonna be at a 8%, I believe, interest rate. It's a, there's a there's a two hundred million dollar fund that they mm -hmm. say there is. I don't know what the rate's going to be. Uh, it is it is a loan. Uh, and another thing I wanted to add, uh, you said one of the qualifications is you have to be profitable, but you also need to own at least ten percent of that company. It's not just I own five percent and I'm okay. You need to no, at least own ten percent of that company. You need to show two years of profitability. Um, and then one thing that I that, that I've heard um, out of these dispensaries, uh, out of this two hundred million dollar fund that supposedly is available, only 50 million have been raised, mm. which is gonna slow down 
the the issuing of the licenses. Now they said it's going to be 150 licenses. Um, apparently they're going to be giving out 20 licenses per month. The, I don't know. These are things that I hear. Do not quote me on it, but this, I'm just giving you a little bit of uh, information for you to to keep in your back pocket. And to and to David's point, team, this is there's so much. And there's there's so much stuff that's still not set in stone that every day there's there's information out there. There's every day there's assumptions, um, some of which come from really great sources. Um, and we try our best to, to really navigate and decipher what's best to 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 focus on. And we do want to share again, we always share that that transparency with you of this is what we're hearing, not necessarily what has been set in stone yet, right? We've been very clear what has been set in stone. And we're also giving you some feedback on what, from our experiences and what we we're hearing within the communities and the conversations we're having, what's coming down the pipeline. All right, now adult use delivery. Team, this is one that the OCM is extremely excited about because they see this as a low hanging fruit for the underserved community, right? Take, this is pretty much the Uber Eats or of, of, of uh, cannabis. It's an ability for you to be able to pick up from a dispensary, right and deliver it directly to a to a uh to end user right this again to be able to you know to to go after this license the upfront costs and then the no you know the, the requirements are not going to be as stringent as for a cultivator license or for a dispensary license right they do they look they look they they show preference specifically in cultivation and and dispensaries for those that have some experience in the in the cannabis space right Whereas here on this adult use delivery uh, opportunity, more so they're, they're just looking if you have the capacity and ability to do so, but it's, it's again, a low hanging fruit for most to be able to, uh, for, for many and under, underserved communities to come in and participate in and really get, get a piece of the pot. All right. And then this team is, it's, it's a, uh, I'm not going to get too deep into this because this is, I'm not, I don't know if it's really relevant for anyone, any of us on this call, but these are for all in all companies, individuals that have been able to participate in the medical um med medical cultivation space and um processing and dispensary space so if you're currently a medical cultivator or processor or dispensary license holder you are not you're you're not automatically grandfathered into the adult use right because that was a you know then again it doesn't give us the community an opportunity to participate those medical licenses were extremely expensive and they were actually very limiting to who could actually participate because it was something along the lines where you need to have even just $10 million in the bank, forgot what was the, the actual application fee, but that was not returnable, right? So the 175,000. Yeah, like it, was, it, was, it was an astronomical number. So so because of that, um, whoever did get it, got their foot in the door first and were able to corner the market before any of us can get in. And they really, again, the OCM wants to give us, people like us, the opportunity to really play the game. Right, so team, these are pretty much all the licenses that are made available. To to David's point, I'm, I do. Today's well, these, these are these are the big boys, basically. The, you know, and and the good thing that we have there written is the fact that the OCM is delaying the issuing of these licenses until the industry starts really to take off, and we start making a little bit of money, guys. Come on, <laughs> for sure, team. And um, and again, the, the the goal here is to look at this. I, I remember this from from a book I once read. Right. It's that one of the things that we sometimes miss out is that we compartmentalize the things that, that are happening and forget that there's a whole journey, there's a whole history, that this didn't just start with the legalization. All this comes from years and years of injustice, of, of, of just the, 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 the cornering, the, the, yeah, and the cornering, the prohibition of this space because of the powers that be, like the tobacco industry, like the alcohol industry, that didn't want this competitive industry to come in and take over, right? And also even on the medical side, right? How many people would rather cure themselves from cancer than having to go through, uh, and this is not medical advice, but there's constant, there's constant uh, research. research and 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 proven, proven facts that show that people have gotten better. I have personal experience with cannabis with my grandmother. My grandmother was on her deathbed not too long ago. She, I took her, I took her some uh, Rick Simpson oil because not only is it very good for cancer, but also very good for people suffering from Alzheimer's. And the um, doctor said that she probably had a couple of weeks left. Brought her some some Rick Simpson oil, and we got her out of the bed to the point where where um, where the the doctor had no idea how her how she was getting better, and we knew why she was getting better. But he did it. So because of all these things, team, just really help. I really want everybody to keep those things in mind and understand the importance of 
what's happening here today and why we're so eager and excited to speak to you all and really just be that beacon and resource center for for this for this industry here in our here in our communities. So without with without being said, I'm gonna be uh, passing it on to Dwayne. Our boy uh, David over here is getting his energy back with his uh, Matter CBD gummies. I see that. Yo, I'm here. Getting it in. Make sure you give me save me some. Uh, so team, this brings us to kind of the end of our presentation, but not the end of the conversation. So definitely want to answer the questions that you put in the chat, and then also open it up for dialogue. If anyone want to come off of mute and share some thoughts, questions, uh, we would love that. But just as some next steps. Uh, as we close out today's conversation, I hope you got a lot from it. Uh, again, a lot of ways that you can kind of get new information. So signing up for our newsletter, if you go to our website, uh, there is a place for you to sign up to get alerts and all the different things that we're going to be rolling out, such as new informational webinars, classes, trainings, uh, different ways that we can connect you to resources within this industry. Uh, signing up for our newsletter will be a big way for you to stay connected. Uh, definitely following us on social media, where we'll be doing similar work, connecting with other partners. Um, and different uh, things that are happening in the industry as events come up. So follow us at the New Grow Center, the New Grow Center on Instagram and all of the platforms. Um, contact us with any questions, uh, info, I-N-F-O, at thenewgrowcenter.com. So that's where you can find us. That's where you can find the website, thenewgrowcenter.com. Uh, those will be three ways to connect with us and to keep informed with everything that we're going to be putting out as far as information. We highly recommend that you go to the OCM website, the Office of Cannabis Management, Again, they're doing a lot to try to keep that website up to date. And um, we're hoping regulations for all the licenses that we talked about uh, recently will be dropping soon. They were supposed to drop in the fall. Uh, so we'll see if they stay on, uh, on track. But signing up for their uh, news alerts and updates uh, would also keep you up to date on things that are happening. So signing up on the OCM website, looking at all the different license types and information that's there, very valuable to you. Um, provide feedback. So when they do drop the regulations, uh, again, on all the different license types, there's going to be a comment period. So the regulations, when they drop, don't automatically become law uh, or policy right away. There's going to be a 60-day comment period for the public to read the regulations and then provide our feedback on what we like and what we don't like, what we'd like to see included, what we'd like to see changed. doesn't mean that everything is going to get changed based on our feedback, but it definitely helps for us to have a say on what we think about what they're producing. Once that 60 day common period is done, they're going to then take all that feedback. They're going to make some adjustments, put it back out to the public, usually for another 30 day period. Um, and then again, we'll be able to have a little bit of say. They're not going to make major edits on that last uh, go around. And then once that 30 day period is over, they'll readjust and then they'll become regulations. Um, so we expect sometime early, uh, let me say early spring to mid next year, that regulations will be done and licenses and applications will start uh, being available for people to apply. Um, and then obviously get involved, uh, come to meetings like this. There's a lot of different associations and meetings and things that are happening around the state. Um, you wanna be there, you wanna network with people, you wanna stay up to date, connected, um, because this is how we share information and we share best practices. We're sharing the things that we learn when we go to these conferences. Uh, we're gonna be at a few of them over the next few weeks. We're actually doing a presentation in Albany on Sunday. Uh, we have another conference coming up in November. We're going to be doing another webinar in November. We're going to be doing something with the city of Mount Vernon uh, at the end of November. So as we continue to be out here uh, sharing this information, we'd love for you to come and join us at any of those events. And uh, that's the way that we build out community team. That's really the way that we, we stay connected and we stay supporting each other. So with that, next slide, we'll have our uh, contact information and all the information for upcoming events. And um, again, Welcome you to put all your comments and thoughts in the chat, but also welcome you to come off of mute um, if you have some things that you'd like to ask. So I see Bernadette, I think, with her hand up, was with her hand up. Um, so maybe yeah. take this first, and then we'll go into the chat. Okay. I'll see you quick, and then we can- I have a question. Mm -hmm. Sure. 